So I'm going to try to give a little picture about how big data can be used in a large integrated health system uh, and, and use some examples to show where we've gone on the road toward delivering personalized, um, proactive, and patient-driven care. So I have to begin with acknowledgments because none of the work that I'll be describing is my own. It's all researchers that are part of our program, uh, especially a team in Salt Lake City and people in our analytics group in Washington, D.C. And if you are in a healthcare system, especially one as public as the VA, it's easy to believe this um, prophet on the sidewalk saying we're all being controlled by the random outcomes of a complex system. Um, and obviously the hope of big data is that outcomes really aren't random, that there is uh, patterns in the data that we can use to improve care and improve outcomes for our patients. And so I'll walk you through quickly um, four examples of how we're doing this in both our uh, care delivery and in our research projects and leave you with some questions that we're still wrestling with as well. So the first thing to know about big data in the VA is it is big. Uh, the VA is a national system with over 150 hospitals and 900 clinics. And so annually we have uh, 1.6 billion visits. Uh, interesting, we have 2 billion text notes which capture, contain a lot of data that's not in our structured uh, data. And when you look at it on a daily basis, almost half a million encounters, half a million pharmacy fills um, every day. The big change we've made over the last five years is moving from using largely static um, snapshots of our data, basically big SAS files, um, to a corporate data warehouse that pulls data from more than 20 data systems. It's refreshed annually uh, and is now used both in operations work and in research. It has the advantage that it's up-to-date data and it's very complete. It has the disadvantage that it's messy. It has all the problems of missing data and errors that you get when you're inputting data from tens of thousands of people across 900 sites. Hemoglobin A1C might be defined 15 different ways across the system, and you have to worry about how to clean that up. So the first place that we really tried to capture all of this data and apply it towards clinical care was trying to identify our highest risk patients. And so a team led by Steve Finn in our analytics group built what they call a care assessment need score to predict the risk of hospitalization or death over varying time intervals. They used a variety of administrative and clinical data, such as prior utilization, existing comorbid conditions. But because we have an electronic health record and have for 20 years, they could also pull in actual up-to-date vital signs, lab values, along with pharmacy. Um, and this was expressed as a score of 1 to 99 um, based on your percentile risk. So if you had a score above 90, you were in the top 10% in terms of your risk for being hospitalized or dying over that subsequent time interval. And so what they found when they did that is that they could produce a very accurate model. And so the C statistic, which is a measure of fit, 0.8, is, uh, shows this is a very accurate model. The blue and orange lines measure uh, predicted versus actual outcomes. And so if you were in the top 10% uh, of risk, you had a 40% chance of ending up in the hospital or dead over the subsequent year. And this data is now fed updated weekly. It's fed to clinicians at the point of care. So they have a, a much better window on who their high risk patients are. But we also learned something interesting when we did this, because we tried to use the CAN score as a way to recruit patients for a new intensive primary care model that we're piloting in demonstration sites. And when we gave the high CAN score patients to our nurses to look at about whether they should enroll these patients, they found that the CAN score wasn't really uh, a great way to identify patients who would be a good fit. And only a minority of the patients did they feel really matched the services that this multidisciplinary team could provide to try to keep patients healthier and out of the hospital. And part of that is because just because you're high risk doesn't mean we have something effective to change your risk. Some of these patients were in the last six months of their life. They needed to be in palliative care. Fortunately, the VA has a very good palliative care program. Some of them had bad chronic disease, but they were managing it very well on their own, and they didn't really need other, other help from us. And this observation has been borne out by work of others, including a team at the Cleveland Clinic Foundation, which looked at their high-cost patients, and they found, using cluster analysis, that there were really distinct phenotypes of patients 
uh, ranging from ambulatory care patients who were very high cost because they were getting regular regimens of chemotherapy or they were on high cost hepatitis C drugs to other groups such as surgical patients who may have some acute event but not be at high cost chronically, or patients who really were critically ill and in the ICU and had very bad advanced um, chronic disease. And so this leads us to our first observation, which is big data is great at improving prediction, but if you're providing care, what you really want to think is predicting for what? And so if you're predicting to match to a particular clinical intervention, you really need to go deeper in your models. And so we're exploring the role of cluster analysis to try to really provide a more nuanced view of the distinct groups of patients and their distinct needs so that we, we can match them better to care. So the next uh, approach that we looked at, and this is led by a group uh, by Matt Seymour, was to look at variation by uh, facility. And big data is really great at looking at variation. And when you're one of a big healthcare system, variation is, is everything you care about. It's what, it, what, it's what lands you on the front page of the newspaper, unfortunately. It's those tales of the distribution. And so when they looked at uh, antibiotic use for upper respiratory infection, we know that overuse of antibiotics for viral disease contributes to antibiotic resistance. And so they saw substantial variation across facilities. These are our 900 facilities um, mapped out here in terms of how likely were you if you presented with an upper respiratory infection to walk out with an antibiotic. But when they looked at this data, it actually suggested, gee, maybe we're not quite so bad because it looks like there's a large group, this pointer isn't quite working, on the left, where the risk of getting an antibiotic is less than 20%. And that made them suspicious that the data actually weren't capturing everything. And so they went and looked at the text notes that uh, went along with these visits. And they found that often the text notes indicated that the provider, the physician or nurse uh, practitioner had prescribed an antibiotic, but the pharmacy data weren't capturing it because maybe they were dispensing an antibiotic directly from their clinic stock or the patient went to a non-VA pharmacy to have it filled. And most importantly, the data, the missing data weren't randomly missing. They were much more likely to be missing if you were seen at a rural clinic or one of our small outpatient uh, clinics because those patients lived farther from uh, any pharmacy and they especially lived farther from a VA pharmacy. So they developed a NLP algorithm to mine those text notes and they applied it to 1.5 million uh, notes uh, accompanying patients with upper respiratory infection and they were able to uh, capture 50,000 more prescriptions. And so this is observation two. Volume of data can't compensate for problems in the validity of the data. And you can't assume that the errors are going to be random. And NLP can help you with that problem. So the next uh, iteration of that project was to look at variation at the provider level. And so this maps out the likelihood of prescribing antibiotics by provider. And off to the right is 100% uh, getting antibiotics to the left is 0%. And what you can see is there's substantial variation by individual providers. Unfortunately, it's not a normal distribution. Things are clustered to the right. Lots of, lots of providers routinely give antibiotics to most patients who walk in with an upper respiratory infection. But what this tells us is knowing this variation may lead us to better clues. One, what is it about those providers who are able to provide more evidence-based practice? How have they negotiated the difficulty of uh, appropriate prescribing. And also, can we provide our prompts and decision support more specifically to those providers who really need it and not hassle all the, patient, all the providers who are already doing a good job? So our third observation is the real value of big data is if you can drill down to look at examination at the level of the provider. Certainly there, are regi there, are, there is regional variation, there is variation at the facility level, but for many decisions driven by the provider, there's very important variation, even within a high-performing clinic or a low-performing clinic, and you need to pay attention to that. So the last example, I think, is the most exciting, but the most, we're the earliest on in this venture, which is trying to use data, big data, to inform patient decisions. We know that trials don't uh, often exclude the patients who we're applying the treatment to. Um, and so 
we want to get better information, more relevant to that patient. We also know patients want that information. Up to a quarter of patients are already seeking out information on patient experience on the internet. But we also know patients don't do well with numbers. Doctors don't do well with numbers. Um, and so matching narrative to the numbers can be very helpful. And so to give you an example, this is a case from the, that the Salt Lake team encountered as they began this work. And this is a patient who actually came into Salt Lake, 73-year-old veteran uh, who'd had a heart attack. He was on dialysis. And he got a, uh, a stent. He got angi angioplasty in a stent. And as a result, had to be put on antiplatelet drugs. Subsequently, had multiple bleeding complications and died. And his family thought, gee, you know, could we have done a better job of predicting that that might be a, a, an outcome? And so when they looked at the data of the VA, they were able to find 62,000 patients who had had a stent placed in the VA. And when you look at their outcomes, 30-day mortality, looks pretty good, it's 2%. And interestingly, that really matches the data from published clinical trials. And that's true at a year, and it's true at uh, two years. But if you drill down to the patient that looked like this patient, the patient who post-MI on dialysis who was 70, those numbers changed dramatically. The risk within 30 days is five times as high, and within a year, a third of those patients are dead. And maybe with that information, we could do a better job of targeting our therapy. So they built this um, template where you can match patients based on your age and conditions, and then you can look at the outcomes depending on the treatments you might be uh, considering. These are treatments for atrial fibrillation. And then you can pull up a little narrative about what um, might have happened to that patient. And so this says that uh, this patient got AFib at 51, he's a veteran of the Army, and he had good outcomes taking amiodarone therapy. You can pick a different outcome, such as death, and pull up the story about somebody who had a bad outcome. So this has raised important questions about this. Um, portraying these uh, outcomes, four per 100, is probably a good way for patients rather than percentages or risks. But there are important questions. What covariates do you match on? We might be leaving out critical covariates. And if you use it to actually say treatment A versus treatment B, there are important questions about confounding by indication, chance variation. There's no confidence intervals around these. And if we try to deploy this at real time, mine data on 12 million veterans in our data, it would really be a computational load on our warehouse. So I'll close with these conclusions. Um, I think we are getting close to being able to use all our data to inform individual decisions. Uh, this has been termed using an N of millions to inform an N of one. There are important areas for our research, especially how do you feed this back in the context of a, a crammed 10-minute uh, patient encounter. Our previous work with decision support is a very mixed record. Clinicians who are busy don't have time even to take a minute out of the, their routine to pull up a decision support tool. But lastly, how you use data is as important as what data you use. Healthcare systems are complex, social organizations. We need to apply the data carefully and uh, conservatively to make sure that we do good and avoid some of the unintended harms. Thank you.